Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day just to be under your leadership and guidance and loving hand. We're learning more about you and why we can rejoice in you at all times. We thank you for this mini-series on being glad. And we ask that you open our hearts in ways that we need them opened. We all have our issues and things we hold on to, Father. As you know, we ask that you open us wide open and just learn how to be grateful despite the details of life in this world. Father, most of all, we are grateful forevermore for your precious Son. Thank you so much for sending him to take our place in the judgment so that whoever repents and believes in him will never die, but live forever saved by your grace. We ask that you bless this message, help us understand spiritual things, and it's in Christ's precious name we pray, by the power of your spirit. Amen. Okay, he has made me glad. Part two. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 103, verse 1. Psalm 103, 1. I hope Sunday was very encouraging and uh, maybe gave you some different perspective. I know it did for me. There's a couple things that have really helped me personally in my own walk with God. But, uh, you know, we each take it to the Lord and ask him to, again, open our, our hearts wide open. Psalm 103.1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's pause for a moment and go back to verse 2 for some emphasis on this series. To be glad in the Lord and to remain glad in the Lord, we must simply not forget any of his benefits. That's our downfall when we forget all of his benefits. And this should probably be part of our prayer life. I know at times it has been part of mine to just ask God, don't let me forget. You know, help me remember always. To always remember his love and goodness, for example. How do we forget? <laughs> but we do. And when we do remember his love and goodness, we're inspired. You know, our hearts are glad because of him. And that is to the glory of God, of course. So we've had this principle the last few messages now. If we have the Lord, we have everything, including opportunities to live in his joy and gladness each and every day we wake up. And it really is an opportunity that it's a shame if we miss out on because it could be our last day. We're going to see him before we know it, right? On Sunday, we looked into exactly what this word glad means. So please turn again to Psalm 118.14. <clears throat> Looks like we'll have a decent amount of time in the Psalms tonight. Psalm 118.14. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. What did the Spirit bring out for us on Sunday? That He, the Lord, is our salvation. And therefore, our reason to be glad. Nothing less than His very person, in other words, should make us glad. And just to know Him, I mean, think about it, just to know Him and to know what He's like that he reveals himself to us. And of course, that he knows you. It's just 
mind-boggling. But notice again verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This isn't a concept, right? It isn't just a description of him. It's his very person that we're getting to know and to like relish in and seek him and relate to him. Look at verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In other words, there's no reason to not be glad in today. There's no reason. Just read these verses in context, right? And you have plenty to rejoice over. So often translated rejoice in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for glad also means to brighten up or to cheer up. And I shared with you on Sunday, after some necessary struggling so that I could see it all as truth in my own life, he cheered me up on that long walk that one day. He finally relieved me, in other words, and made me glad, but only after I came to gain the right perspective about myself and him. Um, he brightens us up in various ways, right? Most of you know this. But he shows us his faithfulness. That's kind of, I think, the main way he does it. He shows us his faithfulness in the face of our unfaithfulness. And it, it just makes him more, more, more grand and more astonishing and gives us more awe for him. So the key principle was the spiritual life can be arduous at times only because we get in the way and first need to struggle through things before he can reveal himself to us in greater clarity. And it's all good, though. It's a really good process, right? There's no other way to get there but to go through it and go through it with him to make sure you go through it with him and just fall flat in your face when you need to before him and, um, you know, Kind of cry out, right? Cry out to the Lord and He'll give you whatever you need. The humble, right? So thankfully in the end, God makes us glad because He reveals His faithfulness to us despite us. We also saw the word glad in the New Testament, uh, but often related to suffering for His name, ironically. The world can't understand this, but we can through the Spirit. Turn again to Matthew 5.10. So this is just a little review from Sunday. <clears throat> and we're going to get back to the fruit of the Spirit as evidence of who God is. And we're going to see some unique scriptures, uh, ones that we might not normally go to for these different um, attributes. But Matthew 5.10-12, through 12, Blessed are those who are persecuted, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember that word blessed, you know, is often translated happinesses in the Greek. So it's supposed to be happy. <laughs> it produces happiness when we suffer for the sake of the kingdom of heaven because we realize the big picture. Verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So again, glad here in the Greek means properly to jump for joy. Again, this is not explainable to the world, but we saw the scene in Acts chapter 5 when the disciples were whipped. What a scene. Can we follow in their footsteps? The answer is that we can, by His grace and power. We can, by grace through faith. We can do the same thing, no matter what we're going through. Especially when we go through something for Christ's name, and we suffer for His name. This word also means exceeding joy, and another Greek word for glad means cheerful. So I think we get the idea. But it's not just a... Um, like a uh, inner joy or a, a um, tone down, you know what I mean? An inner peace. 
Like I originally thought the word glad implied. It's more like an overt joy. It's an exceeding joy. It's cheerfulness. So the truth is that every day we wake up, we believers have the God-given right to be glad, being adopted by the God of the universe. What more do we need to know than that? And he actually gives us the right as his children, you know, as, as heirs. He gives us the right to be glad, to rejoice in his fellowship, in that permanent relationship we've had, we have because of Christ Jesus, guaranteed forevermore. So instead of entertaining doubtful thoughts from our flesh, how about we, we rejoice in his unfailing love? Kind of back to the faith of a child, right? Our flesh likes to overthink things, scrutinize things, be a little cynical or skeptical. Faith of a child says, I'm just going to rejoice in his unfailing love. And that he says it never ends. I'm going to believe he, it never ends because he says it never ends. It's steadfast. It's unfailing, whatever word you want to use. It depends on the translation. But I'm just going to believe that and rejoice. And go on like a child, enjoying my day because I know my father's got my back. It's an awesome thing, an awesome place he wants us to be. And as we talked about on Sunday, is there anything to be more glad about than a permanent adoption by the King of Kings? I mean, eternal security is a reality. It is spoken about in a lot of different ways throughout the whole Bible. If you're a believer in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you belong to Him. You've been permanently adopted. And the Lord dramatically did something about our spiritual poverty to make us rich instead, right? Whatever that verse is where He became poor so that we could become rich. I think in Corinthians somewhere. Jesus left heaven, became poor, so that we could become rich. And we're talking eternal riches with our God and Creator. So, hopefully you're overwhelmed by now with gladness, reasons to be glad. We read about His adopting us in Romans 8, Galatians 4, and Ephesians 1 on Sunday. In a nutshell, we believers now possess the spirit of adoption who allows us to cry out, Abba, Father. And I know, you know, you may have heard these things, we know these things, but what do we do? We get too familiar with them and forget to rejoice and forget to consider them and forget to pray about them and say, Lord, show me what this means, how I'm supposed to cry out to you the right way as Father. God permanently becomes our Father through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, something we can be glad in and not have any reason to stop being glad. And as our dear pastor often says, we can go sit on his lap now anytime we want to. That's how we should look at it. So with this current and permanent relationship with God, how can we not be cheerful, glad, and even jump for joy in our souls? Turn to Romans 8.28 for a little more evidence. A little more evidence of this permanent relationship we have with God now through Christ. Romans 8.28 For we know that those or for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I bring this up because this is in the past tense. We are already justified and already glorified, according to the word of God. There's our permanent relationship, our permanent adoption with God the Father. So this is our position in Christ that we possess by grace, and we get to be glad in it every day. There's absolutely no reason to not be glad in it every day unless you're listening to the lies of the flesh, 
trying to get the better, better of you. And again, it's only when we forget the promises in his word that we lose our gladness, like Psalm 103, 2 instructed us in the beginning. So we started a list of truths on Sunday that we have to be glad about. And what it comes down to is this. It's when we remember who we are in Christ that we brighten up and are properly cheerful because the source of our gladness is him. Again, it's when we remember who we are in Christ that we brighten up and are properly cheerful because the source of our gladness is him. Plain and simple. On Sunday, the Spirit had us focus on his perfect person and his perfect attributes. And he had us look at the fruit of the Spirit as an example of some of his perfect attributes that God possesses in spades. Among many other attributes throughout the Bible, I don't even know that we can put a number on how many there are. Mention about God's own qualities and characteristics as a person, such as justice and righteousness, for example. But in Galatians 5.22, you can turn there again. We see the fruit of the Spirit as some examples of what God is like. So when's the last time you dwelled on his perfect attributes and allowed them to make you glad? Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Today we're going to work our way backwards again, but we're going to insert some scriptures to encourage us, which we really didn't have time to do on Sunday, and just make us more glad, hopefully, right? The more you see about him and his faithfulness and his gentleness, etc., etc., the more you're just going to be encouraged and at peace. So when's the last time you thank God for his self-control? Something I think is easy to forget about. Talk about something to be really appreciative of when you consider that he has the power to judge and will judge everyone at, in the end. And can you imagine if God didn't possess self-control? So not only that, right? Not only that side, where he has held back righteous judgment for the time being. But also, on the other side, the Lord, in his perfect self-control, took himself all the way to the cross for our salvation. Think of the self-control he had. It's beyond us because he had the power to get out of it at any time. He had the power to wipe out all his enemies at any time. Unlike us, right? If we were in the situation, we wouldn't have to exhibit self-control because our hands are tied. What are you going to do? Blow them over or something? You know, we, we literally would be helpless. Well, he was not helpless in that situation all the way to the cross. But he chose to remain steadfast, control himself for his glory and for our eternal benefit. Just imagine if he gave in to his own comforts at any of those moments. So talk about something to be glad about. This is the loving, self-sacrificial God that we serve. And we are to emulate his loving self-control for the sake of the glory of God the Father. On that note, turn to 1 Corinthians 9.24. Again, we are to emulate his loving self-control for the sake of the glory of God. And this famous passage calls us to do this with this thing called self-control. That is a fruit of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 9.24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 
So there's a calling to, again, emulate Christ, to finish the race that God's assigned each of us for his glory. Next we have the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Can you imagine if God were not gentle and the ultimate gentleman? Where would we be? Our Lord Jesus is that perfect person. He's that person uh, in front of us, so to speak, right? He was God in the flesh as a perfect example of who God is, the gentle God that we have towards those who turn to him at least. Here's what he said about his approaching us and helping us. Turn to Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. Again, all these fruit of the Spirit God possesses in spades. I mean, he, he's perfect. And he, he tells us that we can live in these things too by the power of the Spirit. But right now we're talking about His person. And here's what Jesus said about His approaching us and helping us. Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He is gentle. Thank God for that. Be glad about that. And in a passage quoted from Isaiah about himself, look at Matthew 12, 19. Matthew 12, 19. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Do you see his gentleness? And this is the mighty God we serve. What's mightier than possessing the self-control to be gentle? Remember Proverbs 16.32? Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Reminds us of self-control again, right? But who's, or what's mightier than possessing the self-control to be gentle? That makes God that much greater, right? Anyone can just have power and wipe everybody out and say, I'm the best, I'm the biggest, you need to obey me or else anyone can do that. But to be this God, this is the God we serve. Thank God. Be glad. Next, we have the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Again, something we can never get tired of talking about. The Bible says his faithfulness towards believers has no end, being perfect. He's the perfect bridegroom who will always be there for his bride regardless of her infidelity. Let's let the Psalms remind us of his great faithfulness. Go to Psalm 57, 1. Psalm 57, 1. It's great that these things can't be measured, that they have no end. Psalm 57, 1. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. Salah. And then here it is. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Go to Psalm 91 4. Psalm 91 4. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. 
for our benefit, obviously. Look at Psalm 96, 11. Psalm 96, 11. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. We can count on it because his faithfulness is perfect. And Psalm 100, verse 5. Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Are you glad yet? Next we have the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. As I said on Sunday, I think we underestimate and get complacent about his goodness. And the idea came up, do you realize that God is good completely on his own without a reason to be good towards us? And Tozer explained it so well as to why this has to be true. So I'm going to share this quote again from his book called The Attributes of God, A Journey into the Father's Heart. And this is from his chapter on the goodness of God. Why were we created? Was it that we deserve to be created? How can nothing deserve something? There was a time when there was no human race. How, therefore, could a human race that hadn't existed deserve something? How could a man that wasn't yet created earn anything or pile up any merit? It couldn't be so. And then here's the key point he makes about God's goodness. God, out of his goodness, created us. Why were we not destroyed when we sinned? The only answer is that God, of his goodness, spared us. The cordial, kind intention God spared us. And then he went on to say, Why would God, the eternal Son, bleed for us? The answer is, out of his goodness and loving kindness. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Why would God forgive me when I've sinned and then forgive me again and again? Because God, out of his goodness, acts according to that goodness and does what his loving heart dictates that he do. It's who God is, in other words. right? On his own, purely, from his own goodness, of his own heart, from his own loving heart, he decided to act goodly to us to even create us in the first place, but then knowing that we were going to sin and then still act goodly to us? Do you see what a loving Father we have who chose to be good to us completely out of His own goodness? That's what I really took from this. And this is why we can boldly say, God is good. God is good. Forget about your own little life and the details and the things that make you wonder why God's letting you go through certain things. Step back and look at the big picture. He has to be good, or we wouldn't exist, and we wouldn't be forgiven. And turn to uh, Psalm 143 before we move on to the next attribute. Psalm 143.10. Just on God's goodness one more time. Psalm 143.10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. The fruit of the spirit is goodness. So go back to Galatians 5.22. Let's just revisit our list one more time and continue with this with a few more scriptures. Galatians 5.22, 
but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, He's the reason we can wake up every morning and be glad. Because this is Him. At least some description of Him. He's infinite. But we can rejoice in these things. How about the next part of this fruit called kindness? What about God's kindness? The Old Testament often talks of His loving kindness over and over. If you just read through the Psalms especially. But let's see a couple New Testament passages about His great kindness before we go on. Go to Ephesians 2, verse 4. Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He didn't have to be kind, but he is. That's who he is. Thank God. All this to illustrate, to reveal his own glory, the glory of his grace in kindness toward us. In Christ Jesus. Everyone's just only going to be able to drop their jaw. That's why in heaven, everyone's just going to cry out in song. There's not going to be any, you're not going to be able to hold back when you see and the actual revelation of His grace and His kindness toward us forevermore. So what it comes down to is that God chose to be kind to us out of His own goodness. And also He chose to be good to us out of His own kindness. In fact, we see the two of these paired up together in the next passage. Go to Titus 3, verse 4. Titus 3, 4. Hmm. And as, as you probably heard before, you know, in Galatians 5, it's called the fruit of the Spirit, right? And it's in the singular. So you've got all these attributes listed, but it's in the singular. And it just shows us how He is one. And all these attributes are part of Him and are, are simultaneously Him. And, and always and forevermore. Titus 3, 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared... He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Again, verse 4, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. All out of His own goodness and all out of His own kindness. Go to Romans 2, verse 4. One more verse on this. Romans 2, verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? If you're listening right now or you're listening here or online right now and you've never taken hold of Christ as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Don't presume on His kindness. He's been so gracious to you in waiting for you all this time. Just repent and say thank you and receive Him and receive His amazing grace. Next, we have the fruit of the Spirit is patience. Turn to 1 Timothy 1.12. 1 patience. Divine patience. Thousands and thousands of sins later. He still hasn't said enough is enough. 
And the proof of that is that you're still alive. What does the Bible say about God's patience? A whole lot. But right now we have time for this one passage. 1 Timothy 1.12 I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. In other words, if he was so patient to the horrible Saul of Tarsus, then there's hope for us too. He's patiently waiting for us to believe in him. Just as he was extremely patient with Paul. Again, verse 16, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't think we need to say much more about his patience right now. Just let it overwhelm you with gratitude from a passage like that as an example. Some people think they're too far gone and that God would never receive them because of what they've done. But Saul of Tarsus is the ultimate example. And therefore, there's hope for everybody. Next, we have the fruit of the Spirit is peace. God himself is always at peace within himself, within the Holy Trinity. And he possesses perfect peace. And because he possesses it, he can give it to whomever he wants as well. Go to Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, 3. Perfect peace. He is. And he shares it with whomever he wants. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Notice that word. Remember we talked about in the beginning of the message, you know, um, keeping our focus on him and his attributes. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. The Godhead, being one, is always at peace, regardless of outside factors with his creation. And look how Paul describes God through the Holy Spirit. Go to Romans 15, 33. Romans 15, 33. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. God possesses perfect peace, with or without us. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Notice he calls him the God of peace. Look at Romans 16, 20. He uses the same term. The God of of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And finally, on this note, go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. This is who he is. That's the point that should make us glad. This is the God that we have that called us, that saved us. He's perfect in every way and possesses all these characteristics simultaneously and perfectly. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. 
And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Who will surely do it? The God of peace himself. Right? Next we have the fruit of the spirit is joy. God's joy is way beyond us, as are all his attributes. But he is perfectly self-sustaining and happy within himself and doesn't need outside sources to be happy. And he offers us, his creatures, the chance to share in his joy and gladness even. Turn to John 15, 9 for an example. Again, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. He simply possesses joy and has joy in all of his creation. That's who he is. John 15, 9 through 11. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Notice his wish for us, that his joy, even though he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. His mission was to go to the cross, and he knew it. He had the joy of the Spirit. John 17, 13. Go to John 17, 13. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You mean we can have joy when we get whipped? For Jesus' name? Yes, supernaturally, yes. You mean Jesus had joy going to the cross for us? Yes. Unexplainably, supernaturally, yes. And we can possess the same joy. We've got to ask His help. That's for darn sure, right? We've got to cry out when we need it, when we're weak. But that's when He acts on our behalf. And remember this old friend from a few months ago, I believe. Turn to Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 10. Nehemiah 8, 10. Somewhere right in the middle of your Bible, I think. The prophet Nehemiah. Hopefully you remember this phrase. The Spirit encouraged us with this phrase a few months ago. And I forget exactly what the lesson was about, like how it tied in, but but he came up again here for us. And it's a wonderful phrase. Nehemiah 8.10 Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Be glad in that. I've, I've been praying a lot for that. I'm like, Lord, I need your strength and your wisdom. But we have to tap into his joy, it looks like. That is our strength. Anyway, supernatural stuff. And finally, the fruit of the Spirit is love. God is love, as we know from the Apostle John. Perfect love exists within the Trinity. And his perfect love motivated him to create creatures like the angels and us to bless them out of his own goodness, out of his own love to bless them. And we might rightly say that love is the pinnacle of God. And this is the beautiful God we serve, despite how the world lies about him. Turn to 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Just for one verse on his love and how he is love. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Should have had you put some WD-40 on your fingers tonight. It's a lot of scriptures. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration Comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love 
and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. There he is, called the God of love and peace. We already saw the God of peace earlier. Here he's called the God of love and peace. As we can see, we really have an endless list of reasons to be glad and cheered up because we're related to this perfect God and His perfect Son. It all begins with His perfect being. He's the reason we can wake up every morning with joy and peace. And as the Spirit inserted this key principle on Sunday, we mustn't let our happiness depend upon ourselves or what we possess. It rightly can only depend upon Him, our loving Creator and Savior. That's the only way you're going to be happy in a pile of dung, like, like Job was in that situation. It's the only way you're going to be happy in any kind of physical suffering, any type of jail situation. You know, all the possessions go right away when that happens, right? You can't look to money. You can't look to possessions. You can't look to even your own family, right? But you can look to Him, and He can give you His joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We mustn't let our happiness depend upon ourselves or what we possess. It can only, only come from our Creator and Savior. So let's close with the same passage we close with on Sunday, go to Romans 11.33. Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Rejoice and be glad. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your truth. Thank you so much for revealing yourself in your word. And by the power of your Spirit, help us see you more and see the glory of your grace. And how far above this world you are, how infinite you are in all these things we talked about tonight. And let that make us just rejoice and jump for joy even. And have the peace of God that goes beyond human comprehension. Father, we ask that you bless us all as we go and help us spread your good news to a world that is just lost and dying and confused and in despair. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength so that we may do your will while we have time. And we look forward to seeing you face to face in your perfect timing. We ask all these things in Christ's precious name. And by the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen.